You're listening to Speaking Sidemount, the podcast where we talk all things sidemount diving, from equipment, skills, techniques, and sidemount diving expeditions, to interviews with some of the world's top sidemount divers. Whether you're new to sidemount, been sidemount diving for years, or just want to know more, this is the place for all things sidemount. I'm your host, Steve Davis. Let's get wet. Hey, welcome back to Speaking Sidemount. I'm Steve Davis. This premium episode is brought to you by XDeep and with the support of our amazing patrons. Thanks so much to all who support the show. It makes everything you're about to listen to possible. If you want to know more about how you can support Speaking Sidemount, access premium episodes such as this, watch the bonus Sidemount videos, join our monthly Speaking Sidemount live streams, or even come on the show as one of my special guests then go to www.patreon.com slash speaking side mount for all of the details. A special shout out to my main sponsor XDeep who have been absolutely amazing during the lockdown and subsequent reopening over the past few weeks. I finally got my hands on one of the new frameless masks and my long awaited XDeep signature hoodie. Both are just stunning in terms of style, function and manufacturing quality. Look out for them both in upcoming side mount pros videos and hit me up if you have any questions. And so on with this episode. I first met Matt Jevon back in late 2015 when I was being taught and mentored by Tom Steiner at Gozo Technical Diving. Matt and I teamed up on a bunch of awesome dives and also did our fair share of our parade diving at a few of the great restaurants of Gozo. Matt is the founder instructor at Southwest Technical Diving in Kinsale Island where he teaches the full gambit of tech courses, including side mount, cave and rebreather courses. He's also a sports psychologist, rugby and conditioning coach and consults to businesses on strategy at senior management and board levels. As you'll soon hear, Matt was seriously infected with COVID-19 a few months back, which included the period of hospitalisation. Matt shares his first-hand knowledge of the virus and also what he's learned during his recovery and his research into the longer-term impacts for divers. We also discuss our time at Gozo Technical Diving and what we learned being part of and observing the dive training there. Matt tells us about the diving in Ireland, including the Lusitania and the wrecks of Mallon Head. We get into Matt's thoughts on Sidemount in a variety of environments, Sidemount CCR and his work with the Divesoft Liberty. We close with a discussion using Matt's knowledge and experience as a psychologist on how best to deal with the current pandemic and its effect on our lives. All this and much, much more on this episode of Speaking Sidemount. So Matt, welcome to Speaking cool. Sidemount. Hi Steve, great to be on. Mate, it's been a while, it's great to catch up with you. I think the last time you and I saw each other personally was in Gozo back in 2016, so how have you been? Jesus, 2016, that is um, much longer ago than I figured it for really. I've been good, yeah. Life's moved on quite a lot since 2016 I guess, but good times in Gozo. Man, I look back on it with such fondness and I think my wife and your wife, Siobhan, had dinner in Harlow or somewhere like that. I remember that. It was phenomenal. And of course, we did some fantastic diving together with Gozo Technical and Tom and in those days, Audrey as well. So I have extremely fond memories of Gozo. And we might talk about that a little bit later on. But just to get us started, so everyone knows a bit more about who Matt Jevon is, can you share a little bit about yourself and how you got into diving? Yeah, sure. I got into diving back in the late 80s, my previous life I was a bank trader um, specialised in the bond market and, uh, and such like and I ended up in the Bahamas which sounds great but after a few weeks the holiday pace of life and whatever you're kind of left thinking what am I going to do how am I going to entertain myself so I headed up to Stuart Coves who at that time was a relatively new setup just started to do a few dives out of there yeah I loved it really it just gave me a totally new new outlook on life and new things to do so I fell in love with it then and then sort of developed on from there, really. Sort of went technical, early 2000s, I suppose. I swore to myself I was never going to teach because I've been involved with teaching and coaching yeah. in all other walks of my life, whether it had been as a, a rugby coach or in psychology or strength conditioning or whatever. But that didn't last long. So Couldn't help my, yourself, huh? I No, not really. I don't know when to keep my mouth shut, do I? So... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I ended up going out to Gozo. Spent a season there working out with Tom and basically put, I guess, four years of experience down in a year. 
yeah. um, just for the amount of diving and, and with the people that we're surrounded with and the knowledge and the expertise that's available to you. If you sit there and open your mind, open your eyes, open your ears, then uh, you can soak up an awful lot. And I was very, very privileged to be able to do that. So yeah, It's quite a phenomenal place, isn't it? I mean, I had the same experience in 2015, 16, you know, you go there and everything's so chilled out and laid back, you know, which is Tom's way. And yet there's just this immense discipline around the way that they dive and the way they conduct their training and diving. You learn a lot, don't you? You do. And I think, you know, in this business, which is, is full of people with, I don't like using the word huge ego because I, I mean, a good, good big ego is a positive asset, but there are a lot of, there are quite arrogant people in this business their social media and their attitude and their outlook exceeds their ability yeah. and i think what you've got with tom and I, you know there's a few other guys that i could mention not just at gozo but what you've got with some of the guys who've really been there and done it the phil shorts of this world the uh, martin fars of this world you know the guys like that their ability exceeds their attitude yeah. if you like and you can just watch in those guys that they don't have an agenda that they need to put down somebody else's throat. But if you go in there and you listen to them and you spend time with them, you know, you just know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people who are at the top of their game. And yeah. uh, that's a privileged place to be for sure. I remember kind of little saying that came to my head when I was there. It was just sort of my verbal representation of what I saw was it's all talk until you get into the water. And the thing I noticed yeah. with Tom in particular was just how immensely relaxed and controlled every movement had a purpose if he wanted to be still he was still if he wanted to move he'd move he was always in perfect trim it was just immense to watch that and as a you know young aspiring technical instructor to go there we're young i take that word back sorry but as an aspiring technical (laughs) instructor (laughs) it's a bit funny isn't it but as a new aspiring technical instructor it was just amazing to have a role model like that that you could dive with and then to dive day in day out with him and the other people you know i met you there and and so it was not just the group there but it was the people who came as well the other instructors and the other divers were also of a really high standard so it didn't matter where you turn you had great role models yeah there there were great people there and i mean you know i think i was there 2012 for my original internship Mm -hmm. and i pretty much been back every year since to teach, to build time in the hours. And, you know, every time I go there, I learn every time I go there. And I think you just got to, you just got to be able to take that on board. And the day you close your mind to being able to learn something, um, you know, you really need to put your feet up and look for your slippers, you know? Yeah. I made a few comments after my time there as well about learning through observation. There's a certain amount of talk that goes on there for sure in a variety of different languages too, which was always a challenge for someone like me, you know, <laughs> I speak English and the don't always speak that well either. So it's kind of, <laughs> and there's French and German in particular at that dive center, which are, you would almost say the primary languages and English kind of fits in a close third behind those two. But even so, yeah, you learn a hell of a lot through observation, just watching how people prepare for dives and then how they conduct them and what they do in the water. I learned a lot from that. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, that carries in good stead as an instructor as well when you're watching people, you know, you take students for the first time or you're taking divers out, you know. And I mean, now that I'm teaching CAVE and I've got guys coming on board for those sorts of environments, then the stuff that I've picked up there, just watching what Tom does, how he sort of positions himself when guys are prepping their gear and sorting themselves out and how he sort of just nudges into the conversation. It's a great example. Yeah, just one last point on that, just to discuss around being an instructor and having someone like Tom as a role model. I just learned a lot from his calmness as well. You know, I see a lot of instructors get frustrated in the water with their students when they don't either do what they're told or accomplish a task correctly. And I've seen Tom frustrated in the water, but it's always gone by the time he gets to the surface, you know. So his head comes out of the water (laughs) and all you see is a smile. It's just amazing how calm and controlled and when I interviewed him, he kind of said, look, there's no point getting upset at somebody. You've got to give them the space. And all you're doing is putting pressure on them when what you need to do is create an environment that they can grow in. Yeah, and I think he sets a great example with that. And that, you know, that's not easy to do, especially when a student's perhaps done an error that's placed either their safety or the rest of the team's safety at risk. Yes. You know, that's pretty hard to get back to the surface and not tear them. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think you, can always, you can always achieve that. I always remember Tom, we'd get back to the surface or be just walking away from the student. The two of us would be talking, sort of feeding back to each other on how things had gone. 
and Tom's phrase was always Sapun Katastroph. Say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. How was that? How was that dive, Tom? Oh, catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yearned for the day that you didn't get that, didn't you? So yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. When he said okay, that was enough. That was plenty, yeah. Yeah. But it's funny, you know, Tom's attitude in those things carries a lot of similarities to guys you see at the top of their game in, in other sports, you know, mm -hmm. both coaches or instructors or whatever, you know, there's a lot of characteristics that are shared between those guys at the top in diving and the guys that are at the top in, from my own experience in rugby, in, mm -hmm. in motorsport, in, you know, so rally driving, motorcycle racing, you know, there's a lot of guys right at the top of their game in those who have that same approach. Yeah. They're extremely confident. They're so confident to the point that a lot of people would, say that they were e egotistic or they've got a big, a bit of an attitude. Mm. But actually when you get to know them, that's what carries them in that yeah. scenario. But they don't feel the need to push that onto anybody else so that they don't bring the arrogance to it that, that a lot of people can do, you know? Yeah. And I think that to me, that characteristic of, you know, there was a paper described it as super confidence, which yes. I thought was a great expression to use. You see that in people who perform highly not just in diving, not just in other sports, but again, transfer that across to the business environment. You know, you've got yeah. guys who can do the same in the business environment. I think those characteristics are good precursors for success in whatever field somebody with that approach and somebody with that attitude can choose. Yeah, I think confidence, especially when it's earned, right? There's false confidence, which you don't really want to have, yeah. you know, bravado. But when you've earned the confidence that you carry through putting, let's say, in diving, through putting the dives in the water at a high level and being able to accomplish skills and control teams and be part of a team. And then it is your confidence earned, I guess, is the way that I would portray that. You agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I always, when I'm working as a psychologist with people, particularly in high performance, whether it's sport or business, I talk about building this thing called the confidence wall. Uh, I get through a lot of sets of Jenga. So, you know, the old brick, wooden brick game. And what I try and do is we break down what it is that makes you confident into its own individual little items. So for a, a sports player, you might talk about fitness, but you'd break that down into different types of fitness, speed, agility, endurance, and, and all the rest of it. Then you talk about the mental strength. Well, you've got to break that down into all the different elements. Then you talk about the skills. Mm. You know, you break that down into different elements. So you end up with almost the entire Jenga pack that's got something written on each brick and you build those bricks into the wall. Mm -hmm. So when you've got that up to the level that you think it's at or needs to be at for you to have a high-level performance, you can put that brick in the wall. And as you're working on it, you can move that brick closer to the wall or further away from the wall or whatever. And what you find with high performers is that they have well over half of those bricks are pretty solid in the foundations of that wall. And what we tend to do is judge everything on the result. So things go well we put all of the rest of the bricks in the wall. Well, that's not fair. We've still got a lot of stuff we need to be working on. Things don't go so well, we knock the entire wall down. Yeah. And trying to understand what is consistent, what is solid, what is honest and true about the foundations of your confidence, putting it into that sort of visual model helps a lot of people realize that, you know, one bad result doesn't destroy you and one win doesn't make you a hero. Right. So that means when we lost in the semifinal last year, we're still okay. Mate, there's uh, there's a lot of solid foundation in that uh, in that black jersey. Uh, <laughs> we've, put, we've probably got to put another 25 semi-final wins over you before we can start to. Uh, well, it's, uh, don't we get to do that again soon? Yeah, I have to throw that in there just to get it off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see more rugby of that quality. I don't. It was, really... it was insane, wasn't it? It was a really good World Cup, apart from that one match where England were just phenomenal. But there was great rugby, and as you and I shared off, Mike, we're very fortunate. New Zealand, we just had two great games last weekend and we're back into it so let's move on a little bit I want to ask you about Southwest Tech Diving and Kinsale in Ireland tell us a bit about what you do there yeah so Southwest Tech was um, something that I set up with a buddy of mine we did all our cave training together side mat training with Steve Martin together quite a long time ago basically when Steve was just setting off and then we did our cave training I did some of it with Tom some of it with Phil Short and we were just struggling for facilities. There wasn't anywhere in the sale area, despite some of the great diving that we have, to get mixed gas cylinder rentals or, or anything simple like that. 
And of course, I was just starting to teach as well. So we decided that we'd set everything up, but we'd do it as a business. So that's mm-hmm. how sort of Southwest Technical Diving was born. It was just two mates with a bit of an idea. Mm-hmm. And it's grown since then because we've taken care to fit in with the existing dive provision in Ireland. Right. We have a lot of really good private sector dive centers, and we have a strong club system through CFT, uh, which is a CMAS club, and we have quite a few BSAC clubs. So trying to compete with those and fight over a, well, it's quite a small market in Ireland. You know, we've, yeah. we've about the same number of divers in Ireland as you have in Manchester in the UK. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't enough. So what we did is we said, look, we can support these guys and we can offer a pathway through after the recreational businesses have, have sort of topped out with people. If they don't want to go pro or go to dive master or, you know, if they think they want to do something a bit more specialist, side mount, technical, cave, rebreather, that's where we'll step in. And if they, somebody needs mixed gas or high pressure O2, we can provide that. If somebody mm-hmm. needs to rent technical gear, we can provide that. And that's effectively how we set ourselves up. Greg, my buddy at the time, good IT skills, so we were able to get good online presence as well, including our online shop. And we're stuck with the same principle there. We only sell the stuff on the shop that we actually take in the water. Yeah, We're not a box shifter. If we don't dive it, we don't actually sell it. And that's been good for us. It's not going to get me my latest Ferrari. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, welcome to diving some would say huh? <laughs> you know yeah exactly you want to make two million in diving start with four million yeah, yeah exactly. um, but it's great fun it's very rewarding with a lot of the people that we work with we've got some great professional partnerships and we've got some super people who come and, and dive with us and use us and they seem to like what we're doing so we're pretty good on that a lot of the training that we do we actually take abroad to places like Tom's in Gozo or uh, we go out to Croatia or Lanzarote or Greece or Mm -hmm. France or whatever. And the reason for that is that if we're doing a mod one rebreather course, we need five to seven days of good weather and a bit of depth. You know, the diving in Ireland, yeah, I can dive for five or seven days in a row in Ireland, but it's not really where you want to be teaching a course or it's not beginner level diving. There's no real places to do that consistent number of days hours in the water yeah so it's easier for us to go and do warm weather training with somebody in the course of five days we can get 20 hours in the water and then we can come back and do a bit of cold water conversion for them yeah. and, you know a couple of dives in ireland when they're comfortable in the gear and comfortable in the configuration so we tie that into trips and training all over the world really Fantastic. And I guess you're so fortunate before the lockdown, you know, how close you are to continental Europe as well. You know, it's just a short flight with Ryanair or someone, I'm assuming. And uh, Ryanair. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I didn't, didn't mean to paint an image for you. <laughs> it's an easy um, jet. <laughs> no, we're good. I mean, Ryanair does connect as well. We've got direct flights. I live 15 minutes from Cork Airport mm-hmm. and I live five minutes from the ocean. So, yeah, we've got flights all over Europe, easy connections to the States or to sort of, sort of further away places in the Middle East. Right. You know, we did some cave exploration in the Philippines. I did Truck Lagoon. Yeah. Pretty straightforward connections. It's just a really convenient and comfortable place to be. And we've got some pretty good stuff here. I mean, our local wreck is the Lusitania. Wow. Seven Not- miles from where I'm currently sat. Oh, that's amazing. So tell us a bit about um, that. I wanted to ask you about Malin Head, but tell us about uh, Lusitania first and then uh, maybe head on to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Lusitania, obviously huge history. It's the wreck that brought the US into the First World War. It's broken in two. It sits in 86 to 90 metres, depending on tides, off the old Hedekid sail, gravel bottom, and usually subject to quite high currents, and it's covered in a lot of net. It's not a casual dive, and it's not a dive for people even who were pretty comfortable at 80, 90 metres in normal conditions. It's quite a challenging dive in itself, especially if you want to get any, any decent bottom time on it. Yeah. Wreck now is starting to collapse in places, but you know you can dive on the foredeck and still see the original teak planking. You can sort of swim over the captain's bathtub, which is still full of water. Um, <laughs> Funny that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Decorations, I mean, some of the windows and things are just unbelievable. But it takes a lot of preparation and permission to dive it. It's got so many protections on it, which are well-deserved. It's one of those bucket list dives. It's a signature dive, I think, that's up there with the likes of 
Britannic or Queen Victoria. Or... My mate's just come oh, to, boss, uh, yeah, the he's, uh, he's decided that he needs a bit of attention and uh, <laughs> that's a, it doesn't matter what I say or do, he's got to get in here now. This is for those who can't see and are only hearing this, uh, my dog Bodie, named after Bowden Barrett, by the way. He's sleek and fast, eh? So <laughs> it's a good sidestep. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, look, that sounds brilliant. And Maylin Head, I know there's a bunch of wrecks here, but that's on the other side of Ireland from you, isn't it? Yeah, we're right down in the southwest, and Malin Head is up in the north, so it's the northernmost point of Ireland. You've got a huge selection of wrecks up there. At the end of the Second World War, we had Operation Deadlight, where all the German U-boats that used to catch the cargo convoys that came across the north of Ireland into Liverpool and uh, the west ports of the UK were hanging out. So they had nearly, I think, 70 U-boats uh, surrendered and were taken into Derry. And there's now 46, I think, or 47. There's some degree of the number that are literally just out of Malin Head. They were taken out and sunk or used as mm. targets or whatever. There's an audacious, full-on battleship. Yeah. Two or three ocean liners just this year. And Laurentic, although it's a bit shallower and completely flat. Empress is there, but it's kind of a 160-meter dive, so it's a pretty big boy dive. <laughs> You've got Empire Heritage, which was a transport ship bringing Sherman tanks and trucks across. Yeah. Literally looks like a child has taken a toy box of tanks and trucks and scattered them across the ocean floor. You know, the reputation for me, for Malin, is it's up there with your likes of Bikini Truck, yeah. Guadalcanal, Malin Head. It's in that sort of range of, of wreck diving meccas. Yeah. Is it a summer diving a ch- type thing? or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's challenging for me. I mean... Getting good conditions up there uh, is quite hard. I suffer from seasickness, so the, yeah. the dives themselves are fine, but getting there and back for me, uh, I pick my days very, very, yeah. very carefully with that one. It's incredible. All around Ireland, I mean, you know, as I say, we've got just down the road from us, we've got 45 metres, we've got a fully intact Type 7 U boat, we've got 1916 awesome. tanker, uh, we've got the largest bulk carrier wreck in Europe. So outside of the Milford, which is the largest, largest wreck, it's the second largest just off Baltimore. So, you know, we've got a huge amount of wrecks, some really pretty scenery to dive. World War One UC-42, which is another mine lane U-boat. We've got the Ord, which was a ship running in arms and ammunition for the uh, Irish uprising in 1916. So yep. huge history, some amazing dives to do, you know. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, when you say pretty cool, um, I'm assuming the water temperature is down there a little as well. Uh, we're not too bad. We'd probably be relatively similar, I'd say, to where you are in the summer, sort of sort of 14 degrees in the shallows. Right. And then things will drop down into the sort of the sevens and eights as you get deeper or yeah. uh, get out into the winter period. It's not horrendously cold. You know, I've dived a few places and, you know, mines and stuff where it's sort of two degrees and that's, Brent, that's definitely... Different. Yeah, we're 14 degrees in the winter here. That would be about as cold as it gets in the north of New Zealand. And we're in around 20, 21 in the summer. You can easily dive down to 12, 10, even if it were the push. And then dry, and just need some dry gloves and could go colder. It just sounds amazing. I'd certainly have some aspirations to, to get up there at some time, not least of which I need to get back to the Guinness factory because it's been too long since I've been in there. <laughs> The Guinness factory is Dublin, but mm-hmm. we do have the Jameson Distillery, so we ah, have whiskey available. <laughs> we have a superb little brewery, Incan Sale, which is one of these local microbreweries, Blacks, and they make a very nice stout. That's more my water. game. I'm still serving a uh, 15-year ban on whiskey, so I've got some time to go on. <laughs> 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 Listen, we're yeah. laughing, and I want to get onto something that's really not a laughing matter, and that is COVID-19, and the world is really still very heavily affected by this. We're very fortunate in New Zealand, as you and I were discussing off mic, we've almost got rid of it. We had a couple of cases yesterday, which has severely pissed everybody off because it was caused by a breakdown of the border. And prior to that, we'd had no cases for 24 days in a row. So that's a bit annoying, yeah. but we do have it under control. But there's no doubt it's still growing, not slowing around the world. How's things in Ireland right now, firstly? And then I know you had a brush with it, if that's the right way to say it. Tell us a bit about your experiences as well. Yeah. Ireland, I think, got fairly well hit. We have a little bit of the advantage, the same as New Zealand, in that we are an island. We can yes. isolate reasonably well, but we shut down fairly early, but probably not early enough. And we're not in a bad place now. Infection rates are falling, death rates are falling, things are improving. Mm-hmm. And we had a fairly conservative four-stage plan for opening up, and that's being 
accelerating through with care and attention to the current numbers. So stages that weren't due to come through until 20th of July are now being proposed to open up on the 29th of June. We're quite optimistic about things developing. Yeah. Having said that, there is evidence that for some people it's not a, as serious as you might imagine. And I was out for just running a few errands and, you know, you're looking at the youngsters queuing for McDonald's and the concept to them of social distancing and it seems a little foreign. So I would hope that if we can re-emphasize the importance of people washing their hands and social distancing and looking after themselves, that, you know, we can continue to open up because I think the the negative health impact is absolutely horrendous, but the economic impact I think we're going to carry with us for a long, long time. For sure. Um, it's tough from that. From my own personal experience, don't underestimate it. I didn't have a brush with it. It kicked my ass. But I can put it like that. I couldn't walk from one room to another in the house without being like I'd run a marathon. Um, I had to put a stool halfway up my stairs to sit down to rest on the way up the stairs. Unreal. You know, it was pretty bad. And it will affect everybody differently. And diver-wise, we've seen some evidence now. There's divers who pretty asymptomatic, didn't have any real hit from it as such, but are carrying lung damage. Yeah. And, you know, probably for shallow recreational diving, they need to be careful, they need to get it checked out. But getting into decompression diving, where you're relying on the gaseous exchange at the lungs, you know, that's a pretty serious issue. And worker breathing. Yeah. and Yeah. I think, to be honest with you, it's interesting with me with the CCR, because there will be less strain on the lungs with the CCR. And also, the, you know, your issues over... CO2 retention, et cetera, that's something that you've got to watch, but it should be less of an issue than coping with the positive pressure experience of, uh, of open circuit, if you okay. like. I think the CCR approach to it will be easier, but at the same time, I think there's a greater risk of, if you're CCR diving, it's likely you're decompression diving. Yes. And I think that's the element for me is that how is it going to affect the gas exchange? How is it going to affect what's in your loop? How much CO2 production are you actually going to have? It's really trying to sort of understand and process what those are going to be like. Mm. So having been through this experience and talking about future diving now, I mean, what approach are you taking to your own diving having had COVID-19? I'm quite lucky that obviously with a background in sports science and psychology, et cetera, that I've been able to have some pretty good contacts in, yeah. in the field of you know, medicine and hyperbaric medicine, et cetera. So I've been consulting with a lot of people, basically throwing the kitchen at the rehab side. So I've been dealing with an assistant professor, consultant of respiratory medicine, a couple of hyperbaric docs, a couple of physiologists that I know, and also things like working with a world championship freediver on breathing exercises. Mm -hmm. Getting all of those things into place to try and recover as much functionality as possible. Also through the COVID, I stayed off O2. I was admitted for one night only into the hospital, but also because I've got that sort of physiological and medical background, and I'm a tech diver, or tech diving center owner, I've got O2 on tap, as it were. So I'd set up O2 in the house, got everything there so that I could utilize that, but went with the assumption that overutilizing the O2 would reduce the amount of work that my lung tissue had to do, which right. would allow it to sort of shut down. And, you know, it's kind of like if you go for a run and then you don't go for a run again for two weeks, mm -hmm. you'd lose the benefit of that fitness. It's the same. If you don't exercise your lungs, you know, you lose the benefit of it. So putting oxygen in means the lungs don't have to work very hard. Mm -hmm. So I deliberately minimize that. And again, chatting after the fact with my respiratory consultant, that's turned out to have been a big advantage in my favor, you know? Mm -hmm. So if somebody's listening to that, don't turn down O2 if the medics say you need it, but at the same time, don't jump onto the O2 because it means your lungs aren't having to work very hard. Just thinking it through a bit, there's an element of giving your lungs an opportunity to recover and helping your body to oxygenate when it really is struggling to do so. So that's one perspective. But then the other is, as you say, if you're unnecessarily going on O2, you're not giving your yeah. lungs the opportunity to function as they should. I mean, I live in the country and I could literally just go for a walk around the house and yeah. Started off just being able to do one lap around the house, you know, and that was kind of me done during the recovery. But, you know, I've been pushing that on and pushing that on and pushing that on. And, you know, don't tell anybody, but I'm actually back running. <laughs> <laughs> for you, mate. Anybody That's awesome. That, yeah. Anybody that knows me knows if they see me running to look out for somebody chasing me. But it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> To warn the local trucks and buses to stay out of the way. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, hook her on the loose, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
And so are you back diving or is that in your near future? No, it's in the near future. The Dan recommendation up here in Europe is three months from your COVID hit. So my last positive diagnosis for COVID was 20th of April. So that puts me April, May, June, July. So my plan is to be diving again by sort of third week of July. But I've had another chest x-ray and follow-up, monitoring the fitness and the lung capacity and, and outputs. And that's all tracking in, in the direction that we want. Yeah. But I've got some contacts in a chamber here as well. So I'll jump in a chamber for a couple of dry dives and see how I do with that as well. Mm -hmm. We can actually measure the expired gases there so I can see that's what's awesome. happening with that one. Be interesting yeah, so to hear the results of that. I don't know if you're going to write anything up or do anything on that. It'd be really interesting to hear the results of that and if you can discover anything from that. I think the guys that I'm working with are quite keen. We're trying to be as open as possible with the mm. information. So I think they would be quite keen to get something out there when we know. Mm. You know, I've taken a lot from pneumonia. I mean, effectively, the COVID hit on the lungs is a double pneumonia. So what they've used in terms of post-pneumonia rehab and recovery has been useful as well. So we've thrown the kitchen sink at it. Well, all the best for getting back to diving. I know for us, after 42 days of lockdown, the first dive back was just immense. I talked a lot about this pent-up fury of diving, and I went out with the tech dive center that I work with, and we got in the water, and we got once-a-year conditions as well. There was 35-meter visibility on the Canterbury Wreck awesome. and amazing marine life, and we just all got in the water and just took a breathe in and a breathe out, and it was amazing. So I wish the same or better for you, my friend, because it's tough to be out of the water and even tougher if you've been sick as well. Well, I'm looking to come back out to that New Zealand diving a bit. I've, di I've mm. dived in the poor nights out there, which is amazing. So, mm. yeah, I'm really, uh, really keen to get back into that. Yeah. I'm pretty confident about it now. I think, you know, if you'd asked me this at the end of April, I'd have been like, oh, geez, I don't know. But now I'm pretty confident about jumping back in the water and getting back to teaching and getting back to doing some pretty fun stuff, you know? Yeah, love it. So talk about teaching, we talked about side mount and, and I know side mount is absolutely one of your specialties and one of the foundations of your tech diving, but how did you get into side mount originally and, and how does it fit into your overall diving now? Basically, when I was starting down my tech route, I did my first level advanced nitrox tech 40 in a twin set, pretty much like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much like everybody else, when you start off, I had a horrendous time with the valve shutdowns. And I kind of figured I might be looking to do something KV in the future. So when I saw the side mount, and it really was kind of early days for it, I decided I'd give it a go. And I'd actually booked my Tech 45 Deco Procedures course for two weekends. And the only time I could fit my side mount in with Steve Martin was the five days in between the two weekends. So I put a twin set on, did my Tech 45. And you know, by that time, I'd sorted most of the issues out. And then I did my five days of training with Steve Martin did my second weekend for my Tech 45 back in the twin set. And I think that was probably the last time I put a twin set on for about two and a half years. It's quite so compelling, just, especially with someone like Steve, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And Steve's so passionate about it and has that level of real detail and approach to everything. Yeah. So it was cool to be on board with that. And, you know, I really enjoyed the training. I learned a lot of skill stuff outside of Sidemount. It was developmental anyway. And I just really enjoyed the freedom that the side mount gave me compared to what I'd been experiencing in the twin set. So I completed the entire rest of my open circuit training in side mount all the way up to hypoxic open circuit, qualified with a 100 meter dive in the blue hole on two mains, three stages and a razor out in Egypt. And it was just a sense of freedom for me. And then I did a season dive in a hypoxic open circuit on checking the bank statements, decided that that was a really <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> I think if you dive a lot open circuit, a helium bill is just outrageous, isn't it? You were talking 250 quid back then for mm. a dive. And I mean, now we supported a group on the Lusitania last year, and I had to buy seven J's of helium for the eight days of diving that they were doing. And we'd been used to buying J's of helium at 350, 400 euro, and we couldn't buy them at less than 900 euro at this time last year. So it was just absolutely ridiculous. So if you were diving open circuit, you'd have been paying upwards of 600, 700 for your deco gases and your back gas. And then obviously, you know, there's the other advantages with the CCR. So I'd gone from kind of being a passionate open circuit sideman diver and I sort of went, oh, I need to look at these CCRs again. So started off on a JJ in 2011 and just really got on with it. So I ended up as an instructor on JJ, 
because I am passionate about side mount, I probably spend from 2012 onwards picking apart and looking at every single side mount CCR I could get my hands on or take for a try dive. Made a pain in the ass of myself at all of the dive shows with people looking at the side mount CCRs that were there and. They've come through quite an evolution, haven't they? There's yeah. definitely advantages and disadvantages to true side mount CCR. So let's talk them through for a moment, especially in comparison with a JJ, you're diving a very good back mount CCR, right? It's a great back mount yeah. rebreather from all accounts. From there, looking at a side mount rebreather, what do you think the key differences are apart from the way that it's mounted? The biggest difference with a side mount rebreather is your work of breathing. You know, we start off looking at back mount rebreathers and traditionally they'd have the front mounted counter lungs that minimize the hydrostatic pressure between the counter lung and your own lungs. Good design, such as you've got in the JHA or the XCCR and then the MEGs and now in the APs and, and most other units meant that we can now go with back mounted counter lungs. So we don't have to have this big cluttered front anymore. But when it comes to a side mount CCR, you, your biggest problem is where do you put the lungs? So the position of the unit has to reflect a good positioning for the counter lungs. And that's been the biggest challenge with all of the units. There's different schools of thought and they've ended up grouping themselves into, I think, three main groups really. One has been this bellows accordion style single lung approach. One has been to have a functional onboard inhale and exhale lung. And the other has been to have the lung offboard. So, you know, the lights of the sidewinder and stuff like that, that the lungs are off the unit. They've all had little advantages and disadvantages. The problem with the accordion or the bellows lungs, certainly from my experience, is that they breathe very well when you're in flat trim. But if you step outside of a 45 degree to vertical, the breathing becomes hard to at vertical, either heads up or heads down, totally impossible. The offboard lungs for me, there's an awful lot of plumbing to get the gas around in the right places in doing that. And to me, that's taken away from what I wanted with side mount, which was these two tanks on my sides and the rest of my equipment completely clean and clear and, and flexible and the ability to demount either side if I needed to for restrictions or in and out of the water or entries, exits, things like that. Mm-hmm. So because you're trying to get a lot of electronics and scrubber and plumbing and gases into a small space, a lot of the units have plumped for a lot of offboarding answers to those challenges. They're well thought through. They're well designed. They look at the unit like the SF2 all carbon fiber and everything else. It's mm. beautifully made, but there's no onboard gas and it's an accordion lung. So if I breathe out into the lung, the unit becomes positively buoyant. If I breathe in from the lung, the unit becomes negatively buoyant. That to me is a, a challenge or a problem. So yeah, I'd been diving and trying all the different units. And it wasn't until early 2019, very late 2018, that I came across the Divesoft uh, mm. Liberty. And that, for me, had a lot of stuff that just met my choice, met my philosophy of what I wanted from a side mount unit. So totally self-contained, the O2 and Diluent are on board. Proper inhale, exhale, counter lung, so it doesn't change buoyancy with breathing. The lung positioning is right at the top of the unit, so you can have it close to your chest and reduce the hydrostatic pressures. So it breathes heads up, heads down comfortably. It's well-designed, it's well-made, uh, well-constructed and, and tough. So... I can mount it and demount it in one hit. So I, I really liked it. It's a different philosophy in terms of its control and its electronics to the JJ. And I love the simplicity of the JJ, the simplicity of the approach that they have. Sheer water, the JJ doesn't carry lots of buzzers or alarms or treats the diver like, you know, well, you've got to be a grown up here and you've got to monitor what you're doing. We're not going to ring a bell in your ear if something goes wrong. The dive soft is very much onboard checklists redundancy after redundancy you know two solenoids and four cells and two handsets a hood and a buddy light mm-hmm. it's got a lot of things on board that for me i think a well thought through and well designed but it's a different philosophy to the one that i've sort of had eight years of diving in the back mount unit so that's the only thing that i would have personally changed okay you're diving the dive soft liberty and also the jj when would you choose one over the other for a particular dive and what sort of environments and how do you use them So the JJ is really my open water unit, deep technical dives and cave dives where I'm not going to be hitting any restrictions. Mm -hmm. That's in its simplest sense. And then outside of that, the Liberty is one that I'm using where side mount is effectively the right tool for the job. So smaller caves, it works really well shallow because the lungs are relative and the loop size is relatively small. Yeah. So if I want to do a four-hour dive in Mexico, for example, then I'll probably use the Liberty. 
if I'm doing a scooter dive in Rossell uh, in France, I'll use the JJ. If I'm doing the Lusitania, I'll use the JJ. If I'm doing some of the caves in Sardinia, which have got some of the little narrow jump passages off to the side, jump on the Liberty. So that's in its simplest sense. But what I've been doing over the last year is a lot of work using and practicing with the Liberty as a bailout rebreather. Yeah. So a lot of the deeper dives now, my consideration is actually I'm taking both. And the reason for that is that the Liberty has two pressure sensors on board so it can maintain pressure in the loop when you're not breathing from it. So it doesn't flood as you're going through it. And obviously then it considerably reduces the amount of open circuit bailout that I need to carry. It doesn't get rid of it completely. With a bailout rebreather, you need to be carrying at least 30 to 40 minutes worth of open circuit gas because if you have to bail out for a CO2 hit, you're going to be hyperventilating. You're not going to be able to switch to another loop and control that other loop without over-breathing the unit. So all of the bailout techniques that I use and that I teach are effectively jump across rebreathers through open circuit. Yes. But it gives you time as well, doesn't it, to make sure that the loop is and the PPO is correct, the loop's got the right volume, et cetera, et cetera. You know? and, and under a stressful yeah. situation... I guess you don't want to be going from one rebreather to another when those sort of circumstances, do you? No, I mean, a, a CO2 bit is going to be a major amount of stress. Luckily, with rebreathers, that is really the only major issue. I mean, a hypoxic event or a hyperoxic event are fairly quick to solve. Anything else, catastrophic failures, solenoid failures, you know, diluent side ADV failures, everything else, you've usually got a decent amount of time on the loop before you're PO2 starts to drop outside of a breathable distance. So, you know, you've time then to decide, well, actually, it's fine. I can check the other unit and I can go straight on the other unit because I'm not elevated in my breathing. But for any emergency bailout situation, then we train the muscle memory to go through the open circuit so that, as you say, you can sort yourself out, give yourself that little bit of sanity time and check for positive pressure on the unit, check for a breathable loop. Check that it's monitored your decompression penalty correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing. I think what, you're, what we're starting to allude to is this is far, far, far from trivial, and we're right at the very sharp pointy end of technical diving now. It was for a long time a big thing to be rebreather diving, and now we're talking about using two of them. And I've spoken to both Ryan K. Cook and PJ Prinsloo about this previously, and also I think way back to Steve Bogarts about it. And I think all of the luminaries you're nodding your head to say this is not trivial and not for the yeah. faint-hearted, right? There are a lot of guys that I've seen and some that I've trained on on rebreathers where you think that's your full attention, your full capacity is mm. utilized, maintaining your situational awareness on the dive and maintaining your monitoring of, of your unit. That's your resources kind of, you've got just enough to cope with the emergency at that point, you know? Mm. In the event that you're using a second CCR as a bailout option, you need enough resources to, through the entire dive, not when you're going to bail out, but through the entire dive and particularly on the descent, you need the resources available to monitor both of those units. Yeah. Uh, the descent is what will kill an unused rebreather because it needing to maintain pressure. You know, that's making sure that it's maintaining pressure and loop integrity and gas pressures and the PO2 is staying breathable. Those are the things that you've got to be on the ball and on, and on top of. Yeah. So... It's having enough experience, muscle memory, having embedded enough of those monitoring skills into the sort of the autonomic system that you've sufficient mental capacity to cope with that level of monitoring. It's not going to be for everyone. No. I want to circle back to an article that I think you wrote last year too. I think it was something about holy configurations, Batman or something like that. And it was talking about when you choose back mount over side mount. And I think you had a really great perspective on that in terms of the decision process to go through before you switch between one and another. I'd love to get your thoughts on choosing a configuration for a particular dive. Yeah, I think first off, you've got to decide what your configuration is. Potentially, as an instructor, I can teach in the twin set, I can teach side mount, side mount CCR, back mount CCR, single tank, multi-stage, all the rest of it. And the problem with that is, is that unless you do a lot of diving, and you know, as an instructor, I do a lot of diving, but even so, I wouldn't say that I'm doing as much diving as you'd want to, to be fully conversant with all of those different configurations. I think if you dive a twin set and back mount, the DIR approach is a very solid approach, and it's the one I would choose and the one I train students in at the start of their tech diving. But if I dive side mount, I'm diving 
a different configuration. My deco stages are lean left, rich right. Mm-hmm. I don't use trails. I don't stack. So there's an awful lot of muscle memory built into your configuration. So before you jump down any route, decide what it is you're going to be diving more often. If you've got cave in your future and you're going to be going through the beautiful little holes in Mexico or up the Bone Passage in Sardinia or, or wherever, mm-hmm. side mount is what you want to be diving. So choose that configuration. If you've got shoulders that have been messed about with 20 years in the front row and hitting people carrying balls, then... Or if you played halfback and got smashed by some of those guys. That's <laughs> <laughs> we get, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right, mate. So choose a configuration that works for you. And then for me, I might choose to do a dive in side mount rather than in back mount simply because that's the one I've got the better experience and muscle memory. I can put my hands automatically onto everything else Mm. very, very easily. And what I try then and do with with all of my configurations is maintain the same approach. So if I dive a twin set, I still dive my stages lean left, rich, right. Yeah. which isn't ideal from a twin set perspective and long hose deployment and all the rest of it. But the way I view it is the chances of me having to deploy the long hose in an emergency on a technical dive are so infinitesimally small. There's this real chain of negative events had to bring us to that point. So I've got time to sort that out yes. if I need to. But what I don't have time to sort out is the thing that kills on hurts most tech divers, which is making a switch to the wrong gas. Yes. So, knowing that this is my setup, it's familiarity. Yeah. So I'll choose maybe to do some dives. In, no, it's not, but it's the one that I am most competent and most familiar in. My take up from reading the article, you made a couple of brilliant statements in there, but one of them was it is a valid point to choose the right configuration for the dive. There's always a best configuration for this particular dive. But the best configuration for you might not be that best configuration. More weight needs to go onto your skill set and what you can dive and provided it's not unsafe in that environment, that's your better choice. I don't know if I articulated that as well as you would. No, that's entirely the point I'm making that the back mount twin set with two stages stack left might be the best choice for this rep dive. Hmm. But I'm going to do it in side mount because I'm more competent in that. I'm better at that. I'm more familiar with that. And therefore I'm safer for that. And because that I'm safer because I'm a better diver in that configuration, that's the best choice. That's the best choice for the dive. You go back to where we started the conversation, if you like. It brings a confidence with it that if something does start to go wrong, I know I'm not going to worry about, oh, can I reach the manifold easily? Yeah. Circling back to rebreather diving, I've talked a lot about my experiences on the Kiss Sidewinder, but it was one of the things that drove my decision to go down that path was the fact that at this stage of my life, I mean, when I was in Gozo, we were knocking out 300 dives a year, even inside of a seasonal type of environment there. But right now I get to do about 100 to 120 dives a year. It's quality over quantity. They have fantastic dives typically, but it's not the same volume. And so for me, I was thinking, gee, if I'm going to go and start building hours on a CCR, I want something that really is so tightly coupled to my side mount open circuit experience that It's going to be easy for me with that volume of dives. And the good thing about the Sidewinder from that perspective is that if I bail out, I'm immediately in exactly my side mount configuration. I don't use a bob, so I've just got the short hose necklace. I may change to a bob in the future, but that's a really easy switch for me to do. My long hose is still on my right, ready to be deployed, but also ready to be used if I need it. So it's quite an immensely comfortable thing to go through if you are a side mount diver. That was my thinking there is exactly this argument around making sure that you're good at the configuration that you're going to dive most of the time. Yeah, I think that's a solid point to make. And and again, that was in my thinking when I was making my choice Mm -hmm. and unit is, you know, effectively I treat the Liberty as a right side tank. Yes. That's what it is. I can demount that tank and move to something else fairly fast. It works exactly the same to me, but with that one, I can just take it off and it's gone. I mean, I looked at the KISS units and there's some real solid thinking behind those. I just have this thing about manual CCRs. Mm -hmm. I believe that diving in a cave, there are significant advantages in a multi-level environment to having a unit running manually. Having said that, the problem we have with manual CCRs is that they're either constant attention to maintain the PO2 or they're on a constant flow valve, which if you are stopping to put some navigation in and stuck in a restriction for a while or whatever, you're not working as hard and potentially your O2s can shoot up. Mm -hmm. 
all the advantages, I don't see any advantages to a manual CCR now because I can run my unit at a low set point, say 0.4, and I can run it manually above that. It won't unless I actually physically inject, go above the PO that I want it to be at. It won't drop below the PO2 that I want it to be at. Mm -hmm. And if I do forget or get distracted or have to deal with something or whatever, it's still going to give me a breathable gas. Yeah. It's not going to push up or down. So to me, I think the manuals have been nice about it. I think they're yesterday's technology now. Yeah. I think we've moved on. We, we, 10 years ago when we were looking at electronics on rebreathers, you'd have gone, yeah, I'm not going to trust that. 100% yeah. I'm not going to trust it. Today, when we look at shear waters, dive soft electronics, some of the controlling stuff that we've got there, the dive can systems, yeah, that's rock solid now. And no, I'm not stupid enough to trust it unwittingly or on, or, or 100%, but... Now, I'd rather have that option of knowing that that unit is going to do its best to maintain a breathable loop for me yeah. if I don't yeah. do it myself. That was one of a big decision for me was switching across to that is having a full ECCR that I can run manually. Yeah. You know, the downside to the Liberty is you've got to make some mods to it to offboard gases in, which I've done and it works. No, it sounds good. And it is an interesting discussion. I kind of mentally went through it myself when I was looking at the KISS versus others and there's just pros and cons. I do hear what you're saying about technology moving on. I think things are so much better now than they have been in the past. The constant flow orifice is quite interesting. My experience with it so far is if you maintain a constant depth, then your PPO2, you obviously do have to monitor it, but it doesn't change very much at all. I haven't done a lot of testing personally at, under really heavy workloads and light workloads and what changes. I can tell you that if you take a very short, let's say you're doing a tie-off or you stop for a while, a short period of time doesn't make very much difference. Certainly a long period of time under heavy load, you might notice that your PPO2 is certainly going to drop and that circumstance is right in your eye line. And what's the first rule of rubric of the diving is always know your PPO2. The other positive side for it is, especially not so much if you're expedition diving, but even a trip to somewhere like truck or somewhere away from your supply lines, there's just nothing that can go wrong with the thing. You take some spare oxygen sensors and a couple of cables, and there's really nothing that can happen. I have had one circumstance where, especially when I was very new and I had a three-month break after training and I went to put it back in the water the first time, something went wrong. It was very simple, but I didn't trust it anymore. I took the sidewinder off of my side mount harness and went for a brilliant open circuit dive. So there is yep. nothing that's going to stop me diving. And I have seen many divers of various units miss dives where something's gone wrong and they haven't been able to fix it fast enough. So there are pros and cons, but I think your argument is certainly valid that technology is at a point now where it really is getting very good, isn't it? I think it is. And I think the, you know, the nice thing for me, some of the units are equipped that way, is I can treat it like a manual unit. I can dive it like a manual unit. As long as I've got some form of PO2 monitoring system on it, and, you know, if my solenoids and my boards, everything go down, I can still dive it manually. Yeah. So to me, it's almost like I get the, all the advantages. Uh, yeah, I think probably full-on expedition diving somewhere. I mean, I took a pretty comprehensive spares kit out to truck with the JJ and the same when we were diving mm -hmm. some of the more remote stuff in the Philippines, you know, out in the jungles. And But it's all pretty modular. You can... I got to truck with Pete Mears and certainly all the AP and JJ's there. You can cannibalize somebody's unit to <laughs> somebody's toolbox to find whatever you need, you know. <laughs> The only thing with truck is coping with truck ox. <laughs> Not quite the oxygen you thought it was. <laughs> Not the oxygen you thought it was, no. Why, I, why is my loop beating me up at six meters now? Like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've had a couple of high 80s, 100% fills. That was on open circuit, so not such a big deal, I guess. Yeah, we were getting sort of high 80s, low 90s fills. When you're at six meters running a high PO2 and trying to push it, then uh, yeah. your loop volumes can challenge you if you just don't keep an eye on it. So, yeah, it's, it's good fun. Well worth it. Yeah, well, I'm supposed to be in truck, actually. Would I be back yet? I think I would have just come back from a trip with Pete Mears right now. So, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, look, I want to say I'm devastated and gutted, and I am. But at the same time, look, it's just a dive trip. I've been there before. I will definitely go again when I can. A lot of people have been really badly affected by the pandemic, and I, I have been affected. But, look, I'm still eating. I'm still breathing. I'm still diving. It's kind of like, come on. It'll be okay. Actually, yeah. I read an article that you did with Dan about positivity in this environment. I love that as well. From a psychologist's perspective, what are some of the best ways to deal with what's going on right now in terms of the impacts? I think the first thing, mate, is really to normalize it. It's like 
everybody's almost feeling bad about being frustrated or angry or annoyed or it's almost like you start the snowball rolling down the hill isn't it you're feeling a bit angry and a bit annoyed and frustrated that you can't do what you want to do you can't see who you want to see and your life isn't how you're expecting it to be and then because you're feeling that way you feel bad about feeling that way when you hear about people who have actually lost their lives or and i think the first thing is just normalize it just say to yourself it's okay to feel that way this is a really really tough and challenging situation economically physically emotionally for everybody and you actually wouldn't be a normal human being if you didn't feel uh, and didn't have some sort of significant emotional attachment to this situation so yeah allow yourself to have that allow that feeling to be accepted as justified and normal first because if you don't then anything you try and do afterwards is really just to thumb in the dike it's um, Mm -hmm. putting a patch on where without any foundation so yeah get comfortable with that notion first We talked earlier about this concept of building the sort of the confidence wall where we said that certain things and skills and abilities that you've got that stay in the foundation doesn't matter what the result or what's happened. And it's the same thing here. Just what's the expression people have? Count your blessings? Yeah. Take on board what you've got that is yours, the people that you're still connected to. You might not be able to see them, but you're still connected to them. Mm -hmm. The fact that you've got a roof over your head, you've got fresh water, you've got food, you've got access to technology you've got all of these little positive things that we almost take for granted what is it they say now that the bottom line of maslow's hierarchy of needs is no longer shelter and warmth is battery life and (laughs) Um, (laughs) wi-fi this is quite true isn't it yeah Yeah. (laughs) and we forget that actually food shelter warmth basic human needs relationships with others you know that give us that personal and emotional comfort as as what we've got And then say to yourself, what can you do? Not what can't you do now, what can you do? And can you do something that's developmental? Can Mm. you do something that improves you as a person, improves your preparation for diving, for life? Is there something that you, in some way you can have an achievement in? Yeah, something that enriches you. Yeah, but makes you feel good about yourself. We've had a flour shortage in Ireland, right? Flour, Mm -hmm. because people have started home baking. Yep, same. And the internet has been pounded with pictures of people's <laughs> loaves of bread and everything else. But you know what? They, it's brilliant because they've achieved something. You've baked a loaf of bread. It doesn't sound much, but actually that little achievement is wonderful. It's a fantastic thing to have and to, and to put in there. So I think, you know, engage in things and do things that allow you to do that. Hmm. But then accept the fact that, they're going to be rainy days. There's going to be days when things don't seem like they're going well. You're going to get some bad news. You've got bills landing on the doormat, whatever the story is. And again, just accept the fact that your feelings and your reactions to those are normal. Have those feelings, have those reactions. It's like people who try not to cry at funerals. Why? It's a funeral. You should be crying. If you're not crying, the person didn't mean anything to you. Mm. Have the reaction, have that emotion. In some senses, embrace it. You know, you might not enjoy it, but embrace the emotion. And then that will allow you to move through it and past it. Where if you suppress it, it builds up and bites you. Mm -hmm. I do this thing. I mean, some of these things can seem huge to people. One of the exercises we do is I quite often say, you know, whatever you do when you're trying to get past some of these things, the strategy of blocking it out doesn't work. And the the way I can prove that to people is like this. So whatever you do now, do not think about a white elephant. I don't want any image of that elephant or its big ears or its white face and white trunk. Or yeah. well, I don't want any image of that in your mind whatsoever. So just for 30 seconds, don't think about it. And nobody can not think about it. it. It doesn't happen. So you go, okay, so imagine the elephant in a zoo. It's in a paddock. There's a big double doors at the end of the paddock. There's doors on the elephant. Okay, now what can you see? Can you see an elephant? No. Why not? It's behind the doors. Right. Mm. So you've dealt with it. You know where it is. It hasn't gone away. You know where it is. It's in a place of your choosing. And that's the same way we should do with a lot of these negative things and emotions mm. that come into us. Mm. Accept them. Put them in a place. Promise yourself to come back and deal with it when you're feeling ready to do that. And then at least you can start to concentrate on other things that are perhaps more positive or more rewarding. It's really good advice. So if I could summarize that just as a takeaway for Steve. So the first thing is acknowledge the situation and accept it and 
have the emotions that you're going to have around whatever it is that is negative about what's going on right now. And that could be many, many different things. The uh, second thing yep. I picked up there was count your blessings, right? Remember the good things that you have in your life, whether it be the fact that you have food, shelter, that you have friends, that you have family. And the ability, yep. I walk out of my door quite often during the lockdown and I have an amazing view just to watch the sunrise and to watch the sunset each night is an amazing thing. And so being able to count your blessings. The other thing that I've used personally is a little bit of perspective. And this is undoubtedly one of the worst global issues that's affected our lives. But my grandparents lived through World War II. My grandfather yeah. served in the Royal Navy and was sunk three times. My grandmother escaped the bombing in Portsmouth and had to move to Scotland. Compared to what our grandparents went through in the aftermath yeah. of World War II, let's put it this way. If they can go through that, I can get through this. You know, an element of perspective and saying, well, yeah, hey, things are tough, but it could be worse, right? And so I think we, we have a lot of things to be grateful for. I think you're right. And, you, you know, you can look back at your family and, and history and people, you know, there, but you can look to the left and the right of you and you can see people who aren't as well off as economically comfortable, socially disadvantaged, educationally disadvantaged, you know, for them coming out of this situation. You know, one of the things in Ireland that we've got is we've an awful lot of people working in hospitality. Yes. And, there's, you know, there's a lot of people there in, in hospitality because it's great casual and all the rest of it. So, but at the end of the day, they're in higher education or, you know, they'll be fine. With people working in hospitality where they found themselves as a result of, they don't have a lot of choice. They don't have any other assets or skills on their CVs. And compared to that situation for a lot of us, we're very, very privileged and very, very lucky. Indeed. And, you know, we just need to be able to, we don't need to be guilty about that. We need to be able to appreciate that. And if the opportunity arises for us to help somebody else, let's do that because that makes us feel good anyway. Yeah. Count those blessings on yourself. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I'm running businesses in hospitality now. So, I mean, that's, I've certainly seen that and been affected by it. One thing I would say is if you're in a situation Let's look at us coming out of COVID economically now, which is you know, one of the ways that we're going to recover is if you are a person who is able to and perhaps hasn't been as affected as badly, then there is, I feel, a responsibility on you to go out and support your local businesses. And that's the best way you can help them. It's not a handout. It's basically giving them your business. And one thing we've appreciated in New Zealand here is the support that we've received in our little coffee and gelato store has been amazing. And people have been so happy to come. And I think we've been part of the positivity that they've generated. We really focus on delivering great service and making it a good environment. But at the same time, they've come to us and given us their money and their business. And I'm so appreciative of that. It affects me to some degree, but I have a whole lot of staff that work for us. And these are these people who work in HOSPO and they need their jobs. And so it's important that I'm able to keep them employed and that they're able to do what they do. And so we're all intrinsically involved with each other and part of each other's recovery. And I think it's a really positive thing you can do right now. I said the same thing about diving, dive local. Yeah. You know, if you can't travel, then yeah. get out and support your local dive centers because there's an industry as well that's been really heavily hit and your support by diving with them will help a lot. It's been wonderful for us. We've had a number of people being in touch with us saying, can we pay deposits? Can we yeah. you know, pre-book some days and, and pay for days and things like that? And Again, I'm lucky and privileged because of my involvement in other businesses that I don't, mm -hmm. we haven't had to take that. But to get that support from the people around you, the, yeah. you know, your customer base or your friend base, however you want to put it, that's fantastic, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, mate. And look, and here's one closing point on that. You earn that as well. You have to have done a good job and built solid relationships to be able to earn it. And I think if you are in these businesses, we have to keep earning the support of our customers. And so it's a virtuous circle in the end of us doing a good job and our customers supporting us. So fantastic. Totally we've, agree. we've gone on and I know you and I could sit down and do, we could do a Joe Rogan here and go for three or four hours, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but some of us have to get to work, no sir. <laughs> Please pass on my regards to your vastly better half, Siobhan. I hope she's doing great as well. She is vastly, vastly the better half, yes, and Tulane as well, yeah. Thank you, mate. I appreciate it. And please do come to New Zealand. Hey, we have to make that happen, whether it's in the summer or rugby season. Either way, you've got a place to stay and then we'll make sure you have a good time here. Uh, yeah, and the doors are equally open over here in Ireland, mate. We really look Thank forward to that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, fantastic. It's a win anyway, isn't it? Rugby or diving, what? Or both. <laughs> yeah. Cheers, Matt. Uh, pleasure. Hey, it's really nice to catch up with you.
Hey, thanks so much for joining me on this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of the conversation that I had with Matt. It was just phenomenal to catch up with him. He's a really good mate. And as you could tell, we had a lot of fun doing this episode and sharing our knowledge and information with you. If you'd like to know more about how to support Speaking Sidemount and become a patron of the show, then please go to www.patreon.com slash speaking sidemount where you'll find all of the information on premium episodes, bonus videos, live streams, and how you could join me on the show as my special guest on Speaking Sidemount. A big thank you also to our sponsor of the show, XDeep. Please go and check out all of their dive equipment. It's a phenomenal range both in side mount and if you happen to be a back mount diver, then the NX series is as good as anything that's out there. So please go and check that out and support our sponsor. Thanks again for joining me and I'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to Speaking Side Mount from www.sidemountpros.com. If you'd like the podcast, please subscribe and consider leaving us a five-star review. If there's something you'd like us to cover on the show, then let us know via our Facebook page listed in the podcast notes. Thanks again, and we look forward to you joining us on our next episode of Speaking Side Mountain.